Uh, so Dr. Aaron Fraser is a public health veterinarian at the BC Center for Disease Control, whose work includes the surveillance of zoonotic diseases and foodborne pathogens, antimicrobial resistance and companion animals, as well as climate change and tick-borne diseases. Um, and Dr. Susan Cork joined the University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in 2008 as a founding head of the Department of Ecosystem and Public Health. And her research interests include global health, infectious diseases, and veterinary public health. Uh, Dr. Andrew Cameron is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Regina and co-director of the Institute for Microbial Systems and Society. And his lab is working as part of the TCC3W team to improve the molecular detection of zoonotic pathogens, uh, to sequence pathogen genomes, and to understand pathogen diversity. And uh, last but not least, uh, Mr. Stefan Iwasawa is the project coordinator for the TCC3W project at the BC CDC and has extensive field sampling experience um, in the collection of ticks as well as um, other things. So welcome to you all. Um, so their presentation is titled Climate Change and Tick-Borne Diseases, a One Health Approach in Alberta, British Columbia and Saskatchewan. And I think what we'll do is we'll uh, go through the presentation and then there should be some time for questions at the end. Um, so I will hand it over to all of you. Um, so if you wanted to share your uh, slides and then I'm not sure who's going to be presenting first, but um, be me. feel free yeah. to go ahead. Okay, yeah. I'll hand and it over see, to you then, Erin. And can you see my slides? Yes, yeah, okay. we can see We're them, so that is stuff. great. Good, good. Okay, well, I'll kick us Perfect. off just for a, a couple of minutes and the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity. We all appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you our work. We're just at the uh, very tail end of this project. We're just in the wrap up uh, phase um, right now. So it's a nice opportunity to share what we've done. So we've presented this at a few different venues, so I won't spend too much time setting the stage, but just wanted to give a bit of context for, for the project. Um, so, you know, really uh, over three years ago, it started with a series of questions. And uh, for those of us that are working in the western part of Canada, a lot of the maps that we were working with around Lyme disease in particular, but, you know, other uh, tick-borne pathogens too looked like this, um, where there was lots of interesting data and modeling and so on happening in, in uh, the eastern part of Canada. Um, but we didn't have a sense of, of what were some of the, the trends in western Canada, uh, working with, uh, you know, our our colleagues across the different provinces to understand, um, you know, prevalence of some of these tick-borne pathogens and in, in humans and animals, and really coming together to understand what those trends look like. What were some of the, you know, the, the uh, climate predictions for how uh, ticks and tick-borne pathogens might um, change over time or be introduced, such as in the Asian longhorn tick? Um, you know, what are the what evidence needs do do our policymakers need, and, and those types of things, and what kind of capacity? Um, um, do we need to develop? So um, certainly the focus then is in for this project was Saskatchewan, Alberta and BC. Um, so from there, we brought together a group of collaborators um, shown here uh, from, you know, provincial agencies to uh, academic institutions and so on. Um, and with funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada through their infectious disease and climate change project. Um, so really a, a dynamic, uh, you know, multidisciplinary team from, uh, you know, climate science, medical geography, epidemiologists, uh, veterinarians, lab, lab specialists, uh, entomology, knowledge translation, and so on. So really, really um, broad-based team that was brought together. So together, the, the three main uh, goals of, of our project have been around uh, surveillance of tick-borne diseases, uh, prediction and response capacity for tick-borne diseases, and building that sort of One Health capacity more broadly for climate-driven climate, climate -driven diseases. And of course, using this, um, you know, a One Health approach where communication, collaboration, that coordination piece all um, coming together to build capacity uh, in these in these areas. 
So just a little bit more detail around each of those before I turn it over to my um, colleagues. So this first objective was really around improving our detection, monitoring uh, and surveillance of ticks and tick-borne pathogens across the three Western provinces. Uh, so, you know, mechanisms for enhancing passive surveillance, lab, uh, lab techniques and, and methods and so on, and lab capacity. Uh, second objective around, you know, trying to, um, yeah, compiling human animal case data, understanding what uh, those the surveillance of those uh, case, what the cases look like, and then the sequencing component, which um, uh, Dr. Cameron is going to get into shortly. Um, so just a few more details in terms of the passive surveillance. So really working on understanding. Um, yeah, just increasing proportion of, of uh, black-legged ticks and exodes ticks uh, tested uh, for pathogens. Um, in, you know, increasing submission from other sources, so from wildlife, from companion animals, for example. Um, and this is where sort of partnerships with eTech have been um, facilitated through the the project. Each province has their own relationship with with eTech, of course, but together sharing information about how that program is working in one province, and you know, what are some strategies we can use, or messaging, or knowledge translation tools that we can apply in other areas. And then together coming up with different research questions around, uh, you know, an example of this is, um, you know, there seems to be some changes and, and differences between dermocenter species that we had thought were present uh, in the in the West in a certain proportions, but we're seeing other um, seeing some changes there. So trying to understand what we can do to, um, you know, focus some of our surveillance efforts to understand those those differences. And then certainly collaboration, collaborating with our uh, national partners uh, with the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network as, as one example. Uh, and then the lab method piece. Uh, I will leave the genome sequencing to Dr. Cameron, but um, one of the pieces around this project was uh, supporting the development of a multiplex uh, well, it's actually several multiplex tests um, at the BC Centre for Disease Control to be able to detect uh, the, the pathogens listed here. Uh, previously, it was only focused on Borrelia testing, and so this multiplex test is, is well underway just in the final uh, stages of validation. Uh, the second main objective is around uh, increasing that prediction and response capacity. So there's sort of two main components there. Uh, Dr. Cork will talk about objective four, really that um, enhancing prediction and response capacity. So a lot of that, that modeling under climate scenario, scenarios, habitat suitability mapping and so on. Uh, and then an objective around um, knowledge translation. Um, so what, and Stefan will uh, to speak to that as well. And then the, the final one is really around that that uh, one health capacity. So all the structure of the project really centered around information exchange through, um, you know, through networking opportunities, a little bit more difficult during the pandemic to do that. So a lot of uh, those things were remote, um, but, you know, regular um, meetings of, of different working groups within the project. So we had a tick and tick-borne disease surveillance working group, a knowledge translation working group, and a modeling working group, uh, and then supporting uh, different uh, training of um, uh, graduate students as well, and dialogues with uh, decision makers around yeah, just understanding their evidence needs and, and information needs around uh, climate change and tick-borne diseases. So just one uh, last slide before I wrap up here. So just, you know, some lessons learned. Certainly working across, I think many of us know this because I think we all work ac across disciplines. It can be challenging, but the the dynamic nature of those conversations and, and bringing in those multiple perspectives, you can really push these issues forward in, a, in I, I think, a really meaningful way. Um, you know, and, and just that, that the time it takes to build those those relationships and partnerships it does it does take time um you know but once that is established the data sharing information sharing the, the flow of that is um um yeah really meaningful uh, and i think it, i think we've showcased how important it is to have that diversity of government academic um, types of partnerships and and one of the things we did note because of you know we essentially started this project right before the pandemic 
um, hit. And, and so we were able to adapt because we had those those academic partners. Um, we, we were really able to pivot and get some of the work done in a different way than we had intended um, because we had those partnerships in place. So, um, and I think another lesson is around just creating a governance structure that is really transparent um, and that, it, that it, there's a co-creation piece that you come together to create what that looks like, how, how decision making happens, um, data sharing, information sharing, and so on. Um, so yeah, lots of great lessons learned there. Um, we are just at the tail end of this project, as I mentioned, and uh, the next steps are still a work in progress, I shall say. Um, so without uh, spending too much more time, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to uh, Susan is going to present next, I believe. If I've got the order right, is that the, is that right? <laughs> okay, perfect. Hello, can you see my screen? Is that showing properly? Yes, great, that thank looks you. Good. Well, great introduction, Erin. It's been a pleasure to work with this very dynamic team. And I think you're right. Uh, working across disciplines does bring its challenges, but I think at the end of the day, we've all learned so much and I think we've achieved a lot. So that's great. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the modelling work we've done on the Western Black Legged Tick, Saudi Pacificus. We've done a little bit of modelling with the Borrelia as well, although there's less data available for that, and I'll come on to that in a minute. And then I'm going to briefly touch on the Asian longhorn tick, which is something that we're watching quite carefully as it's been spreading across the United States. So a lot of these slides were prepared by my colleague Isabel Colonia and our summer student Carl Dizon, who is going to come and work with us again this coming summer. As Erin mentioned, training students, both graduate students and undergraduate students, has been a key component of the work that we've been doing. So obviously you can't develop models without good data, so we were very fortunate to have some excellent data supplied to us from the British Columbia CDC and also our colleague Liz Dijkstra down in Washington State. So we decided for our models not to use the passive data, which you see on some of the maps developed by ETIC and some of the more municipal jurisdictions, but we decided to use the active data. So largely data that had been collected through tick flagging, dragging, and also the collection of ticks from, from rodents. We used climate NA for our climate models and also some of the environmental access and ecoregion predictions from the North American environmental access. And we worked with climate change specialists with regards to which projections we did for the climate change scenarios. In the end, we actually did two rather than three, just because we were told that looking too far out probably didn't make a lot of sense just because things were changing so rapidly. So Bringing together the active data from British Columbia and Washington, we were able to develop some preliminary presence models and we came up with 81 unique locations. Now, subsequent to this, we have actually got some updated data from Washington State, which is going to change the model slightly, but not really very much different actually from the models I'm going to present in a minute with regards to the habitat suitability maps. So this is a map that we developed for our knowledge translation program, which Isabel shared with Stefan. And you can see here, it's pretty much what you'd expect. And actually, if you see some of the submissions from ETIC, the passive data doesn't look that much different. But you can see some areas where the tick survives very well, thrives. And there's also pockets where Sometimes ticks are submitted and people have found them during active surveillance as well. And you can see Vancouver Island, uh, particularly along the more northern coastal areas there where Stefan I know goes out tick flagging uh, is certainly an area which would be considered hotspots for the tick. Now on saying that, that doesn't necessarily mean to say that's where Lyme disease risk is going to be high because what we're finding actually is the number of ticks submitted that actually have Borrelia is quite low. And that's in contrast to what they find in the east with the Ixoides 
scapularis ticks. So that's an area that we do feel needs a little bit more research. Looking at projections, you can, and probably you're not that surprised to see that it's likely to expand, but possibly move a bit north and be less likely to be found further south. But again, we're doing some more work just to verify that, some more work with the Washington data. But again, not a lot of surprises, but we can certainly see that the habitats where it's likely to thrive are going to expand. And you can also see that up in, in Haida Gwaii in the north, where we really think it'd be nice to do a bit more work. So if we look at Lyme disease risk maps, these are very preliminary and we've really just mapped the passive surveillance data in that map to the left here. And then the map to the right with the purple points is where we've actually had active surveillance data points with ticks that actually were found to have Borrelia. And you'll learn a lot more about some of the findings with regards to the Borrelia that's been discovered from Dr Cameron's talk, because certainly there's some interesting findings there as well. Not all Borrelia are the same, basically. We did do a literature review. Carl Dizon did an excellent job. And what we found is that a lot of really good work's been done, although the majority of the published data is actually from California. But that will change in time because there's a lot of work and some publications likely to come out soon from Washington and also from British Columbia. We're working on a paper right now. So the literature review is published and available, and I think Carl did an excellent job and we invited doc, Dr. Tim Lissick to be part of that. Many of you know he's a pretty well known entomologist in Canada and I must say also our external reviewers were very helpful and they had a real interest in seeing this work published because as a lot of you probably know the life cycle of the western black legged tick is quite different from that of the similar species in the east and largely one of the things we found is that the larval and the nymphal stages do like to feed on reptiles which has probably quite a big impact on what we see with Lyme disease in the west. Most of you have heard of ETIC and also iNaturalist so there's some really good data available there and we will be working on some of that data in the months to come. I'm just going to mention a very quick update on the Asian longhorn tick. Some of you have probably heard of this, Haemophysalis longicornis. It's actually known as a cattle tick in New Zealand, where it was introduced nearly 100 years ago, but it's actually native to East Asia, so Japan, Korea and parts of China. What we did when we did our mapping, because we looked at where it was turning up in the United States, we actually used presence data from East Asia. It's endemic territory rather than the data from Australia and New Zealand. And that was largely because the climatic projections over North America made more sense if we did it that way. If we look at where it is in North America now, it's largely in the northeastern part of North America. It was actually formally identified in 2017 on sheep in New Jersey. But when they looked back in the records, it had been found way back in 2010, but misidentified as a rabbit tick. And I think what this reminds us is you do need entomologists in your team. And if you find something that's looking a bit new, you do need a specialist to have a look at it for you, because otherwise you can easily misidentify species that look similar. So we actually looked at the various data. I won't go into depth here because we probably don't have time. But what we did, uh, Isabel predominantly, and also our graduate student, Jam, Jam Yang Namgyal, came up with this map here. So to the left there, that's where we predict this tick would do well if it was introduced. But I'd like to remind everybody though it hasn't been introduced. It doesn't yet occur even in the western parts of the United States. They are looking for it. But in the east, we can see that the projections, just little spots there where we currently know it's present. We're using centroids of counties because we don't actually have the GPS locations, but it still gives you a pretty good idea of what you're looking at. And then in future habitats, we've done some preliminary modelling, it's likely to move further north. And so our colleagues in eastern Canada in particular are watching that around the Great Lakes regions. It can do quite well on many, many different kinds of hosts, including migratory birds. So the likelihood of it moving further north is, is quite high and probably our colleagues in the CFI risk assessment team have probably done a lot of work on this and can probably comment on that as well. But certainly it's thriving in the United States. I think they're already finding nymphs when they're going out sampling now. And when they do do their tick flagging, they often find thousands of ticks on the flag. Whereas normally if we go out for some of our 
endemic species here in, in Canada, you might be only get a few. So I'm sure we've got lots of entomologists on this call. They can probably answer questions about that. But certainly it's a changing situation and something that we're watching quite carefully. These are just some of the publications and the trainees that have been involved in the team, but very interdisciplinary and it's been a pleasure working with everybody on this project. And here's just a few of the people we'd like to thank for help with developing the models because it's, it's a fairly objective process, but decision making is required every step of the way and you do need an expert's opinion to make sure you pick the right variables and parameters. Thank you for your time. I think we have Andrew Cameron is going to present next for us. And I'm just looking for my shared screen. And as I've lost sight of everyone, can you let me know if you can see my full screen? Yes, that looks good. Great, thanks very much. Uh, great, so yes, my role in this project has been to really uh, explore and develop some genomic aspects and tools for understanding tick-borne diseases in general. And primarily we've been focusing on Borrelia. That's really where we could get the, the greatest jump start in this project, and that's what I'm going to present to you today. Uh, so broadly, two main goals. One was to use whole genome sequencing to understand population structure diversity of uh, Borrelia in Western Canada. And the second part, which I won't have a chance to touch on today, is the development of really genomic informed tools. So once we have these genome sequences, how can we develop even better genomic tools to do surveillance and diagnostics of tick-borne diseases? So part of what makes this quite exciting for us is that there are no whole genome sequences uh, publicly available for uh, Borrelia in Western Canada. So these are the first that I'm going to present to you today. And uh, as a genomicist, what I find particularly exciting about Borrelia is that it's a, it's a puzzle. It's a very complex uh, genome with uh, many sort of diverse elements to it. And on the right-hand side there, you can see uh, the combination of postdoctoral fellows, uh, grad students, uh, technicians, and scientists from uh, both my lab and the BCCDC who have all been involved uh, in this project. And on the left hand side there you can see where uh, ticks were collected from which Borrelia could be cultured. So the genomic uh, information I'm going to show you comes from cultures of uh, this bacterial isolate from ticks. So if we zoom in a bit further we had uh, 51 bacterial isolates that were collected between 1993 and 2016, which is part of the also novelty of this uh, project is spanning that time. And you can see on the right hand side from quite a large number of locations across primarily the lower mainland and Vancouver Island, uh, those hot spots that you saw in Dr. Cork's uh, presentation previously. So to show you what we can do with the genomes and why I think uh, genomes are so uh, important for understanding One Health and thinking about uh, the diversity and distribution of these pathogens is that with the whole genomes, we can take that genetic information and A, identify who are those bacteria. And you can see one of the first things we found when we sequenced those 51 genomes is that there were three species represented there. Um, Borrelia bassetti, Borrelia americana, and Borrelia burgdorferi. And here I'm just showing you a, a piece of the phylogenetic tree that shows the relationship between these different genomes. And you can see also uh, this is colored according to which tick hosts uh, they were isolated from and then which animal hosts those tick, ticks came from. And one thing we wanted to do with the genomic data was to essentially convert it into a system where we can compare it to other studies and traditional typing methods. And what you see there on the right hand side are the eight genes that are traditionally sequenced to type uh, Borrelia and other bacterial species. And in Borrelia, we also like to pay particular attention to the OSP-C gene because that's involved in uh, host infection and is also used to type these bacteria. 
So I'm going to zoom out now and show you all 51 uh, genomes and how they're related. And what I want to draw your attention to are those black stars, because what those are are new genotypes. So they, well, actually, they're all new genotypes. These are new types uh, using the traditional sequence typing method that have not been previously detected or described. So you can see we're, we're detecting a lot of genetic novelty in Western Canada. And we've been able to take this and relate it to uh, genomes across Canada, which I'll show you in a few slides. So I'm going to change the projection slightly here. Uh, so I've changed that phylogeny on the left-hand side that showed the evolutionary distances to now one that better resolves how these different uh, Borrelia genomes group together. And I particularly want to zoom in on two of them here. So sequence type 12 and a NST, which is a new or novel uh, sequence type. And we've just called it NST1 because it's related to the type uh, specimen of Borrelia, uh, the sequence type 1. So if we look at sequence type 12 first, what we see is that this is really a national genotype. So it's detected from coast to coast. And in the top map there, you can see in this light blue color is sequence type 12. So it's been detected in Northern BC or of our samples. We have one from Northern, Northern BC, uh, from the island and lower mainland. And then also it shows up in Nova Scotia. So this is data from the National Microbiology Laboratory. And in the lower two maps here, you can see zoomed in to look at these two regions. And the dates of isolation are put there as well. So these have been detected, at least uh, in our samples from the BCCDC from 2000 uh, up until 2016. Now I want to contrast this with that NST1, where this was one of the most uh, detected genotypes in our 51 genomes. And uh, it was very widely dispersed. So you can see collected in multiple locations uh, across the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island. But what's particularly interesting about this one is that it was so short-lived. So it was everywhere, detected in two different tick species. And yet uh, with all of the sampling, we never see it again after 1996. So sorry, within our genomes, we don't see it again after 1996. And finally, I want to tell you just a little bit more about some of the other components we can see in the genomes when we have all of this data that we generate uh, from these bacterial isolates. And one is the plasmid components. So as I mentioned, these are very complex genomes. There is a chromosome, and then there's many accessory DNA elements that we refer, refer to as plasmids. And uh, essentially all Borrelia, um, certainly all Borrelia burgdorferi have this CP26 plasmid. Uh, that you can see on the left here. And that's the plasmid that encodes this OSPC, this virulence determinant that we can type according to its sequence in these different types. But then when we look at these different plasmids that are all present in the reference genome, this B31 uh, that was isolated well back in the 80s, that when we compare that to our genome sequences on the West Coast, we see presence and absence and partial presentation of these uh, many different plasmids. So uh, quite closely related, we can see the genetic difference here on the left-hand side from the phylogeny. So our nearest sequence type here, uh, one, is very closely related to the type specimen, but has a very different uh, plasmid complement. And then finally, if we go back to think about sequence type 12, which is the one that is detected across Canada, uh, on the right-hand side here, uh, if we look at the plasmid content, just colored a little differently now, uh, we can see just comparing sequence type 12. So on the top here, uh, sequence type 12 from Western Canada, and then compared to those in Central and Eastern, or sorry, these are all in Eastern Canada, we can see different plasmid content. So a fair amount of similarity, but these are very closely related genomes. And yet we see uh, some plasmids missing from some in the West, um, and then there's not much known about uh, most of these plasmids, but I've highlighted three here for which there is some experimental evidence from the lab that the, these, the genes on these plasmids contribute to functions like uh, the ability of the pathogen to infect the tick salivary gland or to infect the tick uh, gut. 
So we can see variability in at least two of these plasmids uh, among our different genomes. And thank you very much. I will stop sharing screen. Once I figure out how to do that, good. Perfect, hopefully uh, we've switched over to my screens now. And of course I can't see anybody, but I'm gonna just have faith that you guys can see uh, the slides up here. Um, yes, it looks good. Awesome, thank you much, Logan. So to jump into the first slide, I'm just going to give you a rundown of some of the knowledge translations that we've uh, products that we produced, uh, along with some of the collaborations and some of the surveillance projects that we've been taking part uh, to the duration of the project and just uh, get us rolling here. Uh, on the left hand side, you can just see our um, kind of a, well, internal ish uh, knowledge translation document basically outlining some of the presentation numbers, the interviews we've done on print and media and on TV, and also some of the social media posts. And then below that is the six publications to date that we had uh, through the project, through project partners and, and information. Uh, Susan uh, mentioned one of those that was put out by uh, the undergraduate student Carl Dyson, and then of course the training collaborators. And then on the right hand side here, we have the um, First infographic the, the project produced uh, looking at basically ticks submitted in Western Canada and those of interest. We kind of have a rough outline of where those ticks are uh, distributed across Western Canada, the tick species of interest. Uh, below that in the middle section, we're looking at actual tick submissions to the laboratory. And uh, you can definitely see that the, in the green here, we have a lot more exodes ticks in British Columbia submitted than compared to Alberta and then Saskatchewan. It doesn't even show up. It's so small. It's such a small sliver uh, just because those exodes species are not established currently in, in in those two provinces. Uh, below that, we look at the actual lab testing of Exodes tick species. Of course, British Columbia leading the, the way in terms of averages over those five years. Uh, definitely a higher amount of ticks uh, tested, but definitely a lower amount, as we mentioned earlier, uh, becoming positive or testing positive for Lyme uh, bacteria. And then finally, just some kind of surveillance uh, notes and systems and stuff like that outlining what's going on in terms of tick surveillance. Um, a, a lot of us have mentioned uh, some of the, the training that's going on, and this is just a smattering of, of some of the students. We had a good, really good distribution at, at University of Calgary, University of Regina, uh, at the BCCDC, and a really a wide range of projects that uh, students were working on, uh, you know, scoping literature reviews. A lot of them took uh, part in active surveillance to, you know, get them out of the books and uh, into the field, which is always fun. Uh, and then, you know, things about lab techniques and even, even on, in Andrew's lab, of course, looking at, at Borrelia sequences and uh, analysis and that regard. Looking at some of the collaborations and this is just a, I'm just highlighting one of them and this took place between the British Columbia uh, Forest Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, Kate Nelson and uh, Sean DeGorsoff at the Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada in, in Lethbridge. Um, Kate had a really big collection of ticks and really didn't know, you know, what, what am I supposed to do with these? I'm, I'm not really experienced. So I actually ended up spending an afternoon with Kate. I uh, got to siphon through some of those ticks and, and basically train her up on, hey, these are Exodes ticks and these are Dermacenter. Uh, we took the Exodes ticks, we shipped them off to the BCCDC for further uh, processing, and then the Dermacenter ticks, Sean was kind enough to take those and uh, do some speciation because we're really curious to know what species we have because uh, historically we've had more Dermacenter andersoni in the province, and I'll just talk about a little bit more about that later. Um, but in that batch of ticks, there were 68 submissions, 68 vials full of ticks, uh, ranging between one and 16. And then the map there of British Columbia shows the wildlife management units. And it's kind of cool to see that all those little dots actually represent uh, where those submissions are coming from. So 21, so pretty wide range, uh, of course, centrally mostly in, the, in the, the bottom half of the province. But we do have those dots up north, They're definitely less populated, but great to see because we're really um, looking for more submissions up north to see what's going on just because there isn't as much surveillance or opportunity to collect ticks up from up there. So just one of the collaborations that took place, 205 specimens, uh, a fair number of those were, were not ticks, which you run into. Uh, people, um, I myself, until I started looking at ticks, I had no clue we had them on the island and was really quite naive in terms of, of ticks and stuff like that. So uh, of course, a, a large portion not being ticks, but then a great, uh, I think 144 of those were determined to be dermacenter ticks. So that's what we kind of the target species we were looking for. 
Uh, one of the collaborations we're working on uh, with the TCC and the British Company Center for Disease Control, along with Merck Animal Health, uh, and and in collaboration with ETIC, is getting submissions of ticks off companion animals. Uh, this is a project that started uh, just at the beginning of this year, and it's going to run for three years. And we're looking for ticks off of pets in British Columbia. We had a, a smaller kind of a pilotish project that we ran with a limited number of, of of veterinary clinics involved, and this one we're definitely opening up to the whole province, and we're really encouraging submissions, especially from up north, because that's the regions that Susan was talking about where uh, because of climate change, the habitat that's suitable is expanding as so we really want to know what the baseline numbers are and how it's changing over time here. Uh, so these are just some of the the um, the advertising materials that Merck had developed and was able to pass on to the clinics that they're associated with to post in the clinics to encourage tick submissions. Uh, last time I heard, I think we had around 60 two or 63 requests for submissions from etic so that's a uh, request going out to the the clinic saying hey yeah that's an exodus ticks that's what we're looking for could you, could you send it to the lab for testing and that's free testing uh for those ticks whereas normally i think since 2013 british columbia has required uh a charge for animals who have ticks submitted off them to be tested um so it's it's great to see this project up and running and, and uh, in the works um, Aaron and also mentioned the dermacenter ticks, and I mentioned that earlier, dermacenter andersoni versus variabilis. Uh, historically, when you look at the data, we have the majority of ticks being dermacenter andersoni when we look at them. Um, uh, back in 2019, 2020, uh, the Canadian Pet Tick Survey took place, and that was under uh, the guidance of Katie Clow. And her results actually from the vet clinic's submissions were that there was more dermacenter variabilis moving in. I can't remember what the percentage, I want to say around 30-ish percent, which is way higher than what we were expecting. Uh, and as a follow up, she actually sent her PhD student Grace Nickel out to BC in 2022 to look uh, for dermacenter ticks and she sampled all across. I think it was a, a number of sites, 30 or 40 sites that she looked across uh, southern British Columbia where you would expect to find dermacenter ticks. Uh, she's done the morphological identification and now she's following that up for confirmatory testing with PCR and we're waiting uh, to hear the results from that. And in the meantime, we're also tapping into ETIC again at the BCCDC, uh, getting more ticks submitted hopefully uh, for for identification purposes, just to make sure uh, what we're seeing and what they're seeing is, is, is matching up is what it comes down to. Switching gears, uh, looking at active surveillance. So the three provinces of Canada uh, involved in the project, Alberta, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, all took part in CLIDRIN, also known as the Canadian Lyme Disease Research Network. And if you look at this map here, each one of those red dots represents a region. And within those regions, we have a number of sites. Uh, so you can see here that it's fairly well represented in those three provinces. Uh, British Columbia actually started in 2019 with just the Vancouver site, uh, and then we moved up and expanded in 2021 after a short break in 2020 um, to two regions. And then finally uh, in 2022, and I'll just flip to that slide now, we've expanded to four sites. So we have kind of the central North Vancouver Island, Southern Vancouver Island, Vancouver region, and finally into the Okanagan where you'd expect to see this. There's the, the coastal mountains here. You expect to see more dermacenter kind of on this side of the province and definitely those Exodes specificus and Angustus ticks uh, in the kind of the west on the, on the west side of those the um, coastal mountains. If we look at the breakdown, so looking at the number of ticks, there's 119 ticks that were collected uh, during 2022. Uh, that was up, and we've also doubled the number. So in 2021, we had 10 sites, and I believe it was 28 ticks collected. 2022, we had 20 sites, 119 ticks. Of those, around 84 qualified for testing. So they had to be exodes, and they had to be a nymphs or, or adults because the, the larva shouldn't have taken a blood meal technically right uh, they said they shouldn't have picked up anything uh, yet and so this is kind of a, just a breakdown and we see of course more exodes specificus and angustus more than anything and nymphs of course because we're sampling in the springtime and that's when you typically see uh, nymphs out and about questing so here's some of the the results for the, these were tested at the national microbiology laboratory in in winnipeg and if you look at uh the the positives that we had so babesia macrodii over in uh, north vancouver at uh, two different parks there um prior to this i think in 2019 is the only positive aaron can correct me if i'm wrong as uh is is there was a case of anaplasma i think uh 2020 there was no sampling 2021 we had negatives for everything and so this 2022 is kind of a big jump so we had nine positives uh four babesia oticolii uh kind of in the gulf islands region there at a park um 
And then finally down below, uh, we have no co-infection going on, actually four separate ticks, three separate ticks here. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, of course, the causative agent of Lyme disease, and then Anaplasma, Phagocytophilum, two separate ticks there that were positive. So reports have been done up. They've been sent off to the uh, respective parks uh, just to let them know what's going on. And also um, the health regions have been notified. And I believe we're, we're in the midst of creating a bulletin just to put it out there so that people are aware of the situation. Uh, and everyone's been talking about eTIC, so I thought I'd throw in a slide just so I wouldn't feel left out. Uh, eTIC free, easy, and fun. Uh, check out eTIC.ca if you haven't heard about it before. It's a public platform for image based identification and population monitoring of ticks in Canada. And since 2017, around 36,000 ticks have been submitted. And here's just a couple of quick screenshots of uh, what the app looks like. It's free to download onto your phone, uh, so make sure you pick it up. Uh, you basically hit the submit button, you, you drop a couple of photos of, of the tick itself that you You've taken. Uh, you plop in some details of terms of where you are, where it's located. Was it off you? Was it off your dog Toto? Um, and then you can drop a pin as to where exactly you think you might have picked it up. Um, and then you can also check out your submissions and you can be a, a you know a super stick submitter and uh, usually within 24 to 48 hours those technicians within your province will get back to you with uh, what species of ticket is um, or if they need more pictures and then also the pertinent information as to what you need to do or or any kind of um, hazards that you may face depending on the tick species itself. Uh, looking at the BC eTIC submissions in 2022, we had around 1,344 submissions, uh, 994 of those were valid, 349 invalid. And if you look at the, the kind of the national rates and compare, we're pretty much on par. Uh, we're working our way up. We're almost at 75 or 76 percent. Um, the the not ticks, a lot of time people submit spiders or or uh, maybe the quality of the picture isn't great, or it, they actually take pictures off of Google and say, hey, this is what I saw because they don't have a, a picture of the tick itself. Uh, so that's what kind of the the invalid submission restrictions, or uh, you get submissions out of the country. I think I had a, a lady um, who was in Kelowna, but had been traveling down in the States and was sure she picked it up down there and then took a picture of it and submitted it. Uh, just to give you some uh, rough ideas in terms of numbers, this actually has data from 2021 and 2022. The 2021, uh, a lot less in terms of submissions, uh, basically due to the fact it was a kind of a soft launch during the pandemic. And then 2022 is when we really started promoting eTIC to the general public. So you can definitely see uh, a rise in submissions. Um, but both it, both years you're seeing that kind of that bump in the spring where you see more ticks being submitted and more more active. And that's kind of what we expect to see. We don't have that kind of the bump mold. It'll usually you see a second peak in the, in the fall. It may be just a little bit of a one uh, in 2021, but you'd usually expect to see a little bit higher, but we're only a couple of years into eTIC right now. I thought I'd show this one because it's submission by human host age range, and you can see that it's pretty much even-ish across the board, except when you look at the zero to tens, and that's kind of what the literature also talks about too. Uh, those those children when you're out into the forest in wildlife areas where you're going to expect to run into ticks, they're the ones that tend to uh, stray off the path into the woods a bit more. You're picking up twigs, you're picking up sticks, and you pick up ticks at the same time. Um, and of course, uh, when you do that, you, you really got to make sure you're checking your child for ticks uh, after you get back and out of those areas. As I mentioned before, there's some great interactive maps or a map on eTIC that you can play around with. Uh, you can look at years, you can look at by province, you can look at by species. Um, on the left hand side, it's just all the submissions in 2021. And then on the right, you can see the submissions in 2022. And I just wanted to point out, like if you look at this orange box that represents all the submissions in 2021 in terms of the area and in 2022, we had a lot more submissions or submissions outside of that box, which is great to see because uh, we'd love to have more information of what's going on up further north. Uh, just a quick clarification, the, the green dots are a single submission, blue is two to nine, uh, orange is 11 to 99, and red is over 100. So great to see that there's uh, lots of active e-tickers out there these days. And you can't talk about ticks without talking about tick prevention. So just quickly, you know, you're walking on cleared trails in the center of that trail, uh, wearing light colored clothing so you can see, uh, you know, the tick on you is what it comes down to. Tuck those pant legs into the socks. Really cool. I do it all the time when I'm out there um, so that you can see the ticks crawling up your legs and they have less chance of getting into your pants and, and biting you. Uh, wear that uh, tick repellent if you can. And then when you're leaving those areas, check yourself and your pets uh, for ticks and also a tick bath, shower to rinse off those loosely attached ticks. Uh, wash and then throw those clothes in the dryer on hot for at least 10 minutes. And then of course the old tick removal using tweezers, go to the, the, the mouth parts and as close to the skin as possible and just gently pulling up until that tick pops off. 
And just a reminder, depending on your area, seasonality, a lot of people figure that in the wintertime you're safe. Uh, on British Columbia, definitely on the island, ticks, as you can see from the, the submissions previously, are active year round. So you really got to keep an eye out. They are definitely more active during certain times of year, uh, but you just got to keep an eye out for that. And with that, I think that's all my slides for now.